on this one, the circumstance is great that we can get it from elsewhere. I know Jack's his mom runs a group for uh, mothers of preschoolers up in Virginia, and they've been watching us as a part of their program. So we're across the country. <laughs> Ooh, I'm loud. Hello, welcome. We are live. Great. All right. Well, welcome uh, to the fourth and final day of our conversation uh, called Mental Health in the Church. And uh, it's been a very quick four weeks. We feel like we just barely uh, get to scratch the surface on some of these topics and we're already preparing for the next one. And there's uh, so many important things to say and dis discuss and we don't want to dilly dally <laughs> and waste any more time because uh, today we are focusing on our last word of the five uh, and then we've got um, a guest to share a bit of her story with us, which will be uh, really meaningful. And then we want to end and conclude with just a word of hope and a word of encouragement uh, and a recap of where we've been and where we want to go from this class. Uh, so as we begin our time, I invite you wherever you are. Welcome to those of you who are watching online or wherever you are. Uh, glad that you've made the time to be a part of this conversation as well. Uh, but let's begin with a word of prayer. And I invite you as we begin uh, just to open your palms. You can hold them up in the air, you can place them on your lap, uh, but this is just a sign of vulnerability. And so as we approach God and we begin this conversation today, uh, God, we just thank you that you're here with us, that you know our names, that you know our stories, you know what's great about us, and you know what we're not proud of, that we've never told anyone else about ourselves. Uh, you know the times we've fallen short and sinned, and yet you still love us anyway. Uh, that promise was made clear, and we would never question it, because we know that Christ gave his life on the cross for us. So today, as we uh, bring all of who we are uh, into this conversation, and before you, God, may it be pleasing to you, knowing that we are working together to be the best uh, version of ourselves, the best disciples that we can be, striving to be healthy spiritually, physically, emotionally, and mentally, so that we can serve you and others. And everyone said, amen. amen. Uh, so just as a, a brief recap of where we've been and how we've gotten here today, uh, the first week we talked about this idea of fear, and how fear is like an umbrella that covers all these other words that we're talking about. Those are on the screen, and we define it as an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain, or a threat. But we also talked about the flip side of that is that fear keeps us safe. Uh, instead of running out in traffic, when we see cars coming by, we're afraid of being hit by a car. Therefore, fear can also be a healthy thing. Fear is not always a bad thing. And the truth we talked about that week was uh, this reality that God is always with us. And that kind of started this progression of God's presence with us through all of these words. Uh, then the second week, we spent some time talking about anxiety. And we named and we spoke about the truth that anxiety is something that we all wrestle with. Sometimes it's just uh, in small ways, in temporary ways, but for others it can be a much more significant hurdle in their life. Uh, it can be debilitating at times, the inability to function in the most simple ways because of the fear, the anxiety that we have about something in the immediate future or in the long term. And we talked about how anxiety is found all throughout the Bible and that our Savior, our Messiah, Jesus Christ, the King of the world, also <laughs> felt anxiety. Uh, but we have tools in our tool belt of how we can cope and manage that. Mm -hmm. And then last week, uh, we had our, our most challenging conversation yet. And we talked about what depression is. And you can see on the screen there are a lot of different uh, symptoms was a word we used, or ways to recognize that perhaps you're experiencing a season of depression. Uh, and we also had the distinction that if you are um, diagnosed with depression, that means these same symptoms need to be present for a span of two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're just feeling these things for a day or two, it might just be a slump, mm -hmm. I think is the word I used to say it. But no reason to panic or have more anxiety <laughs> or more fear that you are depressed because you feel these things. Because just like anxiety, uh, these are normal emotions. These are regular emotions. And once again, we read all throughout Scripture, the heroes of our faith and people that we look to experience these things. 
And as a part of this conversation on depression, we uh, noted that isolation is a part of that mm -hmm. uh, and feeling lonely mm -hmm. or this idea that uh, I'm the only one who can deal with this or nobody's on my side, so I just have to pull myself up by my bootstraps and get through this. And we <laughs> tried to shout it as loud as we could that no, that is not the truth. God does not want us to go on this journey alone. God does not expect us to be tough and put together at all the times. And then that was one of our myths that we're going to kind of tie into today, that my life has to be perfect if I'm a Christian, or mm -hmm. my life has to be organized, or everyone else has got it together except me. And we said, that's just so not true. Mm -hmm. That is so not true at all. And we left with a word of encouragement and this idea that this journey of faith, whether uh, you believe in Jesus Christ and you would call yourself a Christian or you're a part of this conversation because you're really interested in mental health and how often do you get four free therapy sessions <laughs> from a licensed <laughs> therapist. Um, but whatever your story or circumstances, we uh, said, Christian or not, mm -hmm. we're not meant to do this alone. We are created as human beings for relationship, uh, to pick one another up when we stumble and to care for one another. That's core of our hearts and humanity. Mm -hmm. That is not just a religious thing or an American thing or whatever other title you want to put on it. I truly believe that we were created with this sense of caring for others in our heart. Mm -hmm. And so that leads us in today, this idea of community and being together, focusing on the power of relationships, but there's also some downsides to that as well unhealthy relationships, unhealthy patterns, and dynamics. And so today we dive into our fifth and our final word, which is insecurity. Insecurity. Yeah, so today when we are talking about insecurity, here's kind of a, a definition we've placed, kind of put together. Um, insecurity can be used in a lot of different ways. So something who's not, something who is, that is not firm or fixed, something that's not stable, it might break. Um, also a person, when we use it to describe a person, someone who's not confident or assured, they're not certain, they are anxious. So we use this word in lots of different contexts. Um, we know when we look at this word that at some point in our lives, we will all go through a period of insecurity. Um, this is something that's very, like Robert said, it's very human. This right. is not just a woman thing. It's not just a man thing. It's not just a teenager thing. We can deal with insecurity in lots of different settings. Um, when I was thinking about like the beginning of insecurity, I thought, you know, I've never, I've never pictured it this way, but Adam and Eve in the garden, right after sin entered the world, the first thing they did was hide themselves. And before, like their bodies were not anything that uh, we assume paid them any mind. Like they, they were just, you know, existing in their bodies. And then all of a sudden when sin entered the world, they hid. And we talk about shame with that, but I believe there might be some insecurity with that, that, oh, there, I, I have something that I'm not certain about. I have something that I might be um, not confident about. Um, and so they, they hid their bodies. So we know that from when we look big picture at that story of Adam and Eve, we know God never intended for us to be insecure. Right. God wants us to be whole people. He doesn't want us to be anxious. He doesn't want us to doubt or be flimsy or um, not stable. But there's no way to avoid being insecure on this side of heaven. That's part of our humanity. That's part of what happened when sin entered the world and there was the fall of man. And that's part of our belief, right? So insecurity is one of those emotions that we experience that we um, can say is unavoidable this uh, this place in life. We, when I was researching more about insecurity, because insecurity, I should say, is not a diagnosis in my diagnostic and statistical manual. It's right. not something I can say, oh, you are diagnosed with insecurity. But it is most definitely something that plays a part in many, we could even argue, all mental disorders. Mm -hmm. So this is something that um, we could have as an emotion in um, 
a small way, but also it could impact, it can escalate, it can just contribute to some of those symptoms in the other disorders we've talked about, like anxiety and depression. And like the first week we said, fear is one of the most common emotions that exist in the world, and so is insecurity. Yeah. Every single person has multiple insecurities, whether those are things others can see, right. um, and we're gonna talk about examples mm -hmm. of that, but also the internal insecurities and the lies we tell ourselves about who we are. Exactly, so here are a few types to kind of give us a, a better picture of insecurity. So we have insecurity based on a failure or a rejection. This could be something recent, like this says, it also, we could argue, be something that happened a long time ago, but we're still insecure about. Um, Brene Brown does a lot of research on shame and vulnerability, and one of her uh, stories is about art and how a student in an art class in first grade, if they have a task of coloring the picture of a horse and they decide to color the horse blue. I think this was actually a story of someone she interviewed for her research. This person colored their horse blue and the art teacher said, what, why did you do that? Horses aren't blue. Where do you find a blue horse? And that student felt shame and insecurity and they never pursued art. So we, when we talk about coping skills, that's often um, a thing that we talk about exploring is being artistic and creative and having space to do that and help that side of us that God put in us. Um, it kind of gives us life. And there are times where failure or a rejection of an idea or a creative part of us, um, it could impact us for the rest of our life. So this person as an adult is now realizing oh, I always say like, oh, I can't color, I can't draw, and never is applying themselves in those settings because right. of this first grade teacher that they had. And the same thing is in the life of the church. I can't tell you how many folks mm -hmm. uh, have joined this church in particular, and you know, they're, they're a little bit older, they're maybe in this season of retirement, and they say, well, I haven't been to church in 40 or 50 years, and now that I'm at this point in life, I feel like it's time to uh, get back involved as I'm nearing yeah. the end of my life or this new season. I say, well, if you don't mind me asking, what kept you away from the church for your entire parenting when you had small uh -huh. children or in the middle of your career? I said, I'm new to both of those things, and I feel like I need <laughs> God now more than ever mm. dealing with those things. And I can't tell you the dozens and dozens and dozens of times I have heard someone say, well, when I was in middle school or when I was in college, uh, I didn't feel accepted mm -hmm. at the church. I felt rejected by people at the church, and so I never wanted to go back. I didn't want to be a part of that, but I never realized there were churches like this one. Yeah. And so I always take that as a compliment, that <laughs> hopefully we're a church that is welcoming and we're mm -hmm. not judgmental of anybody's decisions or the way they live their lives, but like God welcomes us with a wide embrace, we want to welcome everyone yeah. that walks through our doors with an embrace as well. But 30, 40, 50, sometimes 60 years people mm -hmm. avoid church or a life of faith and a public life of faith like coming to church because of one thing somebody said and they've been insecure about it their exactly. entire life. And that goes into the second type, a lack of confidence because of social anxiety. So that's exactly what you're saying. Social anxiety is this fear of being judged. So I'm not going to pray because what if my prayer isn't as good as the pastor's? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to pray out loud. Or um, in grade school, I'm not going to, like, volunteer to read because what if I stutter or, like, I don't know a word. Like, can I read ahead? And no. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. what I always did. Like, read ahead. Okay, yeah, I know all the words. I can volunteer. <laughs> um, and then the third type of insecurity is insecurity driven by perfectionism. And I am guilty to the <laughs> T of this one. And I know I'm not the only one. We have a few hands being raised in the room. So another thing about insecurity are the different settings we might see this in. So we said church, that's a, that's a, we don't even have that on there. <laughs> that might be relationship. Um, but in work, in our performances, in our relationships, in our appearance, in our finances, we can feel all these different types of a lack of confidence, a social anxiety, a um, uncertainty, what was another word we had, a failure or a rejection, and feeling like we need to be perfect in all of these areas. Yeah, and I think we have to name with all of these things, social media does not help at all. That's um, right. We I've don't often, even have social media. I often media. have to <laughs> remind myself of this idea that po people only post the best parts of mm -hmm. their life. 
on the internet. Nobody posts about the mess that their house is or how dirty their car is or how yeah. little money they have. They only post when something great has happened to them. And then if yeah. you've got a lot of friends and you're constantly just swiping and scrolling and mm -hmm. seeing, wow, new car, new job, new opportunity, new whatever, you're mm -hmm. like, well, I've had the same car for 10 years mm -hmm. or my bank account hasn't gotten a lot bigger. Yeah. And then you begin to just tell yourself, well, everyone else is doing better than I am, mm -hmm. which is an insecurity and it's oftentimes a lie. Yeah, exactly. Last week we talked about this idea that our thoughts and our feelings and our actions are all related. So if we're thinking a certain way, that might impact how we feel and then that's going to determine what behavior we have. Same with how we feel, impacting what kind of thoughts we have and that's gonna impact our actions. And then sometimes our actions, it, our behavior is the thing that can touch on our thoughts and feelings. For instance, I think we might have mentioned it, but I wanna drive this point home, that with COVID and the year 2020 that we've been experiencing, our behavior, our, our action, our physical um, requirements to isolate have impacted many people's thoughts and feelings. And that is so normal and that's happening to everyone. So in all of my sessions, almost like maybe every other session I conduct, I'm having to say, yeah, but we're in the year 2020, like give yourself a break a little bit because of course this is hard. It's hard for anyone, but it's especially hard for someone dealing with an overlying uh, mental health issue yeah. that we're talking about. So our actions can sometimes be the thing that impact our thoughts and our feelings. So that kind of goes into um, what we wanted to explore today about this is, it might be hard to see here in the room, but it's a picture of an iceberg. So there's supposed to be a top that kind of got blurred <laughs> out. <laughs> but you can see the water line and there's a boat to kind of illustrate this. And I use this all the time. It's one of those, you suffered my drawings in I think the second week, I decided to find a clip art for this week. But I put these words in here because these are very common um, surface level emotions that we see or uh, behaviors we see that kind of are a signifier of an underlying or a core hurt. So when we see someone who's stressed or who's just angry or mad or someone who's acting kind of mean, there could be this underlying feeling of feeling worthless, feeling unimportant, feeling not valued, underappreciated, forgotten, unwanted, we can go on and on and on. And whatever kind of hurt that you're feeling that doesn't have this um, easily recognizable behavior with it can be put in there. Um, and so it, when we're feeling a core hurt, insecure can go under there too, right? These all point to that. So when we're feeling insecure, it might look different to other people, and we might not know what that looks like. That could come out as someone being mean. It could come out as just being angry, being impatient. It could come out as just being stressed and putting more on your plate to kind of mask that perfectionism. Mm -hmm. um, just this week, I had someone who, um, the reason why we, we wanted to talk about this also this week is there are, we'll go to this next slide. I love this quote. I've seen it a few times on social media, I don't know who was the originator of this quote, but I go to therapy because of people who refuse <laughs> to go to therapy. <laughs> and we just laugh because that's why that might not be the only reason to go to therapy. It often is a part of why someone might go to therapy for a relationship or a, a lie that they've heard that's impacted them. So unlike the other words that we've talked about, fear, anxiety, depression, isolation, those are oftentimes kind of isolating, isolated emotions, like personal um, emotions. We are independent in those oftentimes, but insecurity can very much be a dependent emotion where someone else can influence this feeling of insecurity in us. Um, that can look like a lot of different things. It can look like when someone, and I'll, I'll use a personal example, this week someone uh, did not respect a boundary that I have set with them. And boundaries are, that's a whole nother month long course mm -hmm. on boundaries that we should do one day. Um, 
but boundaries are super important to help. It's kind of like a coping skill that we've talked about. It's a way to help our mental health, to stay healthy. That I know that if a situation happens in this way and I don't have control over it, I'm not okay. My insecurity might be heightened. I might become very anxious. And so in order to help with that, I can set this boundary. So I've set a boundary with someone and they did not respect the boundary. And other people were involved. It was a little embarrassing, honestly. And when I called the person out on this boundary, they called me a hypocrite. And I thought, oh, this is a great tool to use for today, a great story. So this is um, something that I do not believe uh, was true. It's a lie that was being told. I don't think that me setting a boundary was something hypocritical. Um, I think it's exactly what I should do in that situation with a toxic person. And when that happened, I was feeling confident enough. I had preparation. I had enough uh, like strength in that moment to not go down a path that I shouldn't. But if I was not feeling that way, I could easily have become mean. I could have been defensive. I could have said something unkind, or I also, it could have looked a different way where I could have become very quiet and really internalized this word that was used that um, when I think about it, I know it's not true. I know that in this moment I was not being hypocritical, but that's something that if I'm worried about being perfect, that I'm going to internalize, and then I might look at uh, other situations, other relationships, other places that I've been, was I being hypocritical there? Is that true? So it can really cause some self-doubt, and that's kind of what, we, what we're wanting to name, that we, with insecurity, could have these myths that other people tell us. That's an example I do with clients often. Like, what are some things you've learned about yourself from other people? What are some things that you have learned about yourself from your spouse, from your mom, from your children? from your teachers, from your neighbors, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Do they think that you are a way that, uh, a way that you're acting is, is that true? Is that something true about you? Or is that a lie? Like you're not lazy, you're just depressed right now. And so that's a mental exercise that you can do to kind of fact check this insecurity. So Robert, what about insecurity in the Bible? Let's talk about that. Yeah, so to kind of preface, um, I, I, one of my favorite sermon series that I've ever heard and uh, been able to listen to it was just this idea of, have you ever recognized that in the Bible, God often chooses the most mm -hmm. unlikely of people to do the most significant things? Uh, that God doesn't look for what oftentimes humanity looks for. We look for somebody that's uh, influential or powerful mm -hmm. or been deemed wise or you name the adjective. Uh, celebrity comes to mind, like somebody that is uh, proven themselves already, but uh, God doesn't look at what we often fall into the trap of looking at for leadership or talent or gift or whatever that is, but there's a scripture in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel that says God looks at the character of a person's heart, mm -hmm. and that's how God identifies who God will use. Um, and so I, I picked out four different Bible characters to share this week, and they all have Four very different stories, so I'll share a little bit about them, uh, but then also kind of a takeaway that's applicable to a lot of different groups of people. So the first one to highlight is Abraham. Ah, Abraham's already on the screen. <laughs> uh, so Abraham, I, I selected him normally because uh, most people have uh, stopped having children uh, in their 30s or their 40s. Uh, however, Abraham was around 100 years old when God finally fulfilled God's promise to Abraham uh, to give him uh, a son with Sarah by the name of Isaac. Uh, so God fulfilled God's promise to Abraham. And kind of the takeaway I have from that is you are never too old to do important work. And on the flip side of that, for those of us who are maybe younger than Jessica and I, you're never too young to do important work. Don't let someone think you have to finish your education or you have to have this experience to make a difference for God. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus was teaching at the temple when he was a teenager. Um, there's, no, there's no perfect age to serve God and to serve someone else. You can't be too young or you can't be too old. Uh, another interesting character in, uh, is Rahab. And she was one of the most interesting and unlikely people to ever be used by God, at least by humanity standards. Uh, she was a prostitute living in Jericho who provided refuge 
uh, for Israelite spies when they went to scout the town and its surrounding areas. And even though the king of Jericho, the, whole, the king of the entire city, <laughs> commanded that the men be brought out so that they could be punished, Rahab protected them. And as a result, God spared her and her family when the Israelites entered the town and overthrew it. And the takeaway I have for that is this idea that your past doesn't define what your future has to be. Mm -hmm. And that God doesn't uh, negate uh, the ability to use someone based on what they've already done. Mm -hmm. God can use anyone. Uh, The third person that I remember and think about in Scripture uh, is Moses. And when God brought... Uh, was bringing his people from captivity in Egypt. He selected Moses to be the person to do that. And then Moses killed uh, an Egyptian for beating up a Hebrew. So then he fled Egypt and went into the wilderness and uh, hid so that he wouldn't be killed for his actions. And then if you grew up and you know this story or you've heard it before, God spoke to Moses through a burning bush and said, you will be the one to go and set the people free from Egypt. Um, I can't even imagine what hearing God in a burning bush would be like. I can't even imagine (laughs) returning to a city that you had escaped for Mm. murdering someone. Uh, And then in Exodus 4.10, Moses responded to God, O Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now, even though you have spoken to me. I get tongue-tied, and my words get tangled. But God used... Moses to lead the people anyway, reminding Moses that God would always be with him. And that sounds familiar to us. And then God used Moses a lot. We read about him with the Ten Commandments. Uh, And the takeaway I have from that is our physical limitations are not barriers for how Mm -hmm. God can use us. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't just have to be uh, a stuttering or something that people can see, but any physical limitation, God can use us for that. And that one's an especially meaningful story for me because two of my Uh, closest friends in the whole world uh, had a stuttering issue for their whole lives, and they still uh, named it. That's something that they're incredibly insecure about, Mm -hmm. and uh, I have watched other people literally make fun of them right Mm -hmm. in front of them to a group of people for how they stuttered in a presentation or a project, and just the harm that did to my friends, it just, it's unbelievable, but then you, when you take a step back and you think, well, why did that person make fun of them for stuttering? They're covering up their own insecurities by bullying someone else. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's another takeaway for that. We Mm -hmm. oftentimes make fun of others or put other people down because we're feeling worthless Mm -hmm. inside as well. Exactly. Uh, So Abraham, for his age, and we talked about you can't be too young or too old, Rahab being a prostitute and how our past does not define what our future is going to be and how God could use us. Moses with his stutter and his physical limitations. And lastly, perhaps the most relatable one, Uh, One of my favorite favorite biblical characters is Jonah. Uh, Jonah was a prophet who God called to go and minister to the people of Nineveh, which was an evil and a corrupt place. They were considered godless and in need of (laughs) repentance. Uh, And Jonah said no. Uh, And he tried to run away from God, got on a boat, and the storm came. And then we read that a big fish swallowed him. He was spat out. And then he went to Nineveh, and God gave him a second chance. And he was able to preach, and they repented. It's a little bit of a sad ending of that story for poor Jonah. Uh, But the message I take away from that is uh, stop trying to run from God. If you're running from a call to ministry, if you're running from a new opportunity that you're afraid of because you fear you're not the right person, who told you you're not the right person? Your own mind told you you're Mm. not the right person. Or whatever it is. And I get a good laugh out of this. One of my favorite sermons I ever preached about Jonah was I just said, the moral of this whole story is stop running. Nobody likes running anyway. It's exhausting. <laughs> so just be present with God and respond to God. <laughs> so for this topic of insecurity, the myth we're talking about today is the belief that everyone's life is perfect but yours. Everyone's life is perfect but yours. Robert mentioned, uh, you know, when we're talking about how we've had to isolate this year, social media has been really neat to um, just have access to the outside world, (laughs) outside of our homes and our bubbles. And um, with that, I I did not look up this statistic. I should have. I do know it is less than 10%. I want to say it's even less than 5% of the reality that is put on social media. So 
a person's life, they only put, I really think it's less than 5% mm -hmm. of their life is what is up on social media. So we don't see their insecurities, right? We see things that make us look like their lives are perfect. So this myth is false because no life is perfect. No life is perfect. Perfection is something not attainable in this life. On this side of heaven, perfection is not attainable. But the truth about this, and I love this, is that God does not want and God does not even expect perfection. Yeah, and so to illustrate this point a little bit further, uh, we want to invite our friend Pearson uh, to come. And when Jessica and I were preparing for this class, she pulled us aside and said, hey, I have a little bit to say about this. Can I maybe uh, share my story with you? And when she did, we said, uh, absolutely. Uh, your story ties in perfectly to one of the things we want to talk about. And so uh, we want to have her come and just share a little bit about her story and who she is and what brought her to this place. And then uh, talk about kind of her journey uh, with mental health in the church and the, the healing that she has experienced. And because of that, in this process of healing, now she wants to share that as a word of encouragement to others. So, Pearson, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your story. And I'll let you uh, take it away and tell us a little bit about, more about who you are. Awesome. Well, like they said, my name is Pearson, and I'm going to share a little bit about me with you all. So a little bit about my background. I was born in Richmond, Virginia, but I've moved about everywhere in the, on the east side of the U.S. My dad was a football coach, so moving was a very common thing. <laughs> um, I have a, three siblings, an older sister, a younger sister, and a little brother. And I'm 24 years old, and I just recently married my husband in January. Um, I was also a college athlete. I grew up playing all sorts of sports, and very early on I discovered that that was who I was, was an athlete. So growing up in sports has its ups and downs. Like I said, I moved, and so it gave me an easy way to find friends. On the flip side, it came with a unique set of criteria of how I was evaluated, and it was based on my performance. So as somebody who learned how to swing a bat before I learned how to walk, I, my understanding of performance was that it was equal to my worth, and that stuck with me throughout my entire career of athletics. So my freshman year of college, I went to Mississippi College on an athletic scholarship for volleyball. And I ended up, I was actually starting, I was starting in the starting lineup and I was playing really well when it seemed like I had control and I loved that. So, um, but after a couple of bumps in the road, I um, met with my coaches to discuss what I needed to work on. And the response I got was perfection. I couldn't make a mistake in practice. And so what my coach had just explained to me, um, it validated everything that I believed about myself growing up was that my worth equated to my performance as an athlete. And so as some of my teammates had started to um, do some new diets and try some new exercise routines to stay in shape, another part of my identity was being threatened, and that was in being a very small athlete. And so I couldn't let that happen. I couldn't let somebody else become better than me because I was like, well, I have to be the best at something. Mm -hmm. And so when I realized this, I began de er, improving my appetite and improving my, um, my meals so I would eat the healthier option, which there is really isn't that much of a healthier option, just a forewarning. <laughs> um, and so I would increase my cardio workouts also. And so this also followed me into the summer. Um, I went to work at a place called Strong Rock Camp. It's up in Cleveland, Georgia. It's a wonderful place. Um, and like I said, my behaviors followed me there. So at the end of that summer, I realized that I had lost some weight. And what my mind did in that moment was tell me that I looked way better than I had before and I needed to continue to drop weight in order to remain the best. And then, of course, if I lost weight, then I would be a better athlete. Um, so during my sophomore year, our, um, as one of our assistant coaches was our interim head coach. And because some, some of our other coaches had resigned that year. And during that preseason, I still found that I wasn't playing as much as I'd hoped. And... Um, and what that did for me was trigger my brain to think that I was a disappointment to my coaches, my teammates, and myself. So I decided that I needed to remain the best at being small, so I decreased my caloric intake even further and ran four to six miles every single day to help me lose weight because I was like, well, maybe they'll see that I have worth if I'm the smallest. My anxiety also led me to engage in some unhealthy coping skills like self-harm. But the main reason I engaged in these behaviors was because it gave me a sense of control. I didn't have control in volleyball anymore, but here I could control what I did to and what I put in my body. So I ended up going to see a therapist after my assistant coach noticed some of my behaviors, and to avoid talking to our head coach about it, I didn't want to talk to her about it. 
Um, but there is my first experience in therapy, and it helps me un unravel some of the reasons of why I think the way I do and how to cope with my behaviors in healthy ways. Now, I went to therapy because of the self-harm. I didn't think food was an issue then. So I ended up transferring schools, um, but still my behaviors followed me there, and it got worse. I was afraid of disappointing another team, another coach, and I couldn't live with that. So I ended my, so my volleyball career at the end of my sophomore year. I found no passion or joy in the sport. And that summer again in 2017, I went to work at camp. I was worried though, for some reason, I've never been worried when I went to camp, but this summer I was because I didn't have volleyball anymore and I didn't have that thing that helped me stand out. So I said, I have to be the best counselor, I have to be the smallest, I have to be the best. Because my mind, especially in sports, told me that my worth is based on being the best and be having the best performance. So my behaviors can tend to worsen. Even any time that I had anxiety, I would decrease a meal or I would exercise more, I would engage in self-harm because that helped me have control and I, I really enjoyed that control even though it made me miserable. But on Father's Day of 2017, I had the opportunity to call my dad and tell him Happy Father's Day, but I told him that I needed to come home. So he, of course, came to get me, and I knew that if I didn't go home, I would probably die. Um, but I also feared of letting down our director and our leadership staff, who I greatly valued. I, he, my, the director is like my second dad, so I was like, oh my gosh, he's going to think I'm awful mm -hmm. if I leave. But they had nothing but love and care for me. They wanted what was best. But I, I didn't understand that. How can somebody care for you if you don't identify as something that's worth caring about? Mm -hmm. um, once I got home, my parents took me to a doctor who specialized in treating patients who were malnourished and had eating disorders. So after some tests, they immediately placed me in the hospital for malnutrition, bradycardia, or an abnormally slow heart rate, and low iron. I was then admitted into a treatment facility on July 17th of 2017, where I was diagnosed with anorexia nervosa and a generalized anxiety disorder. I was in their partial hospitalization treatment, and um, I actually really <laughs> enjoyed going there. Well, I didn't at first, but I'm very thankful I went. Um, I was, my dietitian was a Christian, and so that really helped me see that my identity was in Christ, and it wasn't in something that was materialistic. So she spoke so much biblical truth um, that I, when I was there and in our sessions, and I was also able to continue to see what conditioned me to think the way I did and why I processed things differently. She, um, so because of her relationship with Christ, I was able to see that manifested in her, and then I was able to see that my identity really was in Christ and only him. So other things might be a part of me, but the core of who I was is in Jesus. Um, I graduated from the partial hospitalization program on November 3rd of 2017, and then I graduated from the intensive outpatient treatment, or IOP, on December 15th of 2017. And during those six months of treatment, I grew tremendously in my relationship with Christ, but it wasn't always upward growth. Of course, I had the days where I felt good about who I was in Christ and I could get through the day without anxiety attacks, but then there were the days where I would get frustrated when everything seemed, seemed impossible to recover. I wanted to quit a lot. But since graduating from treatment and starting my recovery journey about three years ago, there are still ups and downs. I have continued going to therapy sessions. They're not as often as they were when I first started and when I first got out of treatment, but they're still just as important. What keeps me moving, though, is my relationship with Christ and knowing that I can rest in my identity in Him. Many days I want to go back to what I had before, control. The challenge to let go of that identity hasn't been simple because it involves giving up a piece of myself that I've held so close to my core since mm. an early age, and it was something that was tangible. I could see it. It means entering into the unknown and trusting that while you, we may not always see or hear God with us, he's always with us, and he's helping us prepare the field for rain, for recovery, and for life. So. Thank you. Thank you, Pearson. So <laughs> we have a few questions for you to kind of explore your story of healing a little more. So in the beginning, when you kind of started this, your story began, your story towards healing, and you didn't know or you didn't have the language to talk about how you were feeling. What was that like? What did that feel like? 
Yeah, so as an athlete, it's really important to understand that everything I did, all of the behaviors, with I guess the exception of self-harm, was affirmed by my teammates and coaches. All my behaviors were applauded, and so I didn't really see anything that I was doing as unhealthy. Um, as somebody who's a people pleaser and a perfectionist, I thought I had to reach this perfection. So in my mind, I knew that I wasn't okay, but, um, and there were comments from others on both sides that were positive, like, oh, hey, you're doing a great job, like, you, like, you look great, I wish I could look like you. And then there were others, like my, my parents, who were concerned about me. Um, but um, what that did, though, and my brain convinced me that all of those comments, whether they were positive or negative, um, it convinced me that they were trying to set me back. And so um, I, so I d took it as that, and I just I, I coped with unhealthy mechanisms, and that's kind of how it felt when I didn't know how to describe what I was feeling. Yeah. So these unhealthy patterns formed when you didn't know, you didn't, you had all these messages that you were internalizing and finally, so what, what, what was the point of noticing, okay, I do need some additional help with this? Yeah, so in the summer of 2017, when I called my dad on Father's Day, um, my dad and my little sister had actually visited me the day before that. It was our sec, it was the end of our second session of camp, so I had been there about four weeks um, and immediately when my dad got out of the car, he knew that I had lost some weight. And um, from what I had when I first started, and my mom, she actually told me, Pearson, you don't need to lose any more weight. And I was like, no, I, I do. Like, there's never enough. Like, I always have to lose more. Um, so me and my bad body image stage, I was like, no, like, I'm fine. Like, my dad was like, Pearson, I think you've lost weight. No, I'm fine. Um, but throughout their whole visit, they were concerned about me. Um, one of our family friends, their eldest daughter, had just recently passed away from an eating disorder and diabetes. And so after talking with my dad and having some time to think after they left, I was like, I, I do need help. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. But I didn't think anybody would believe me because I knew I was sick, but I didn't have a fever. So mm. I didn't think that anybody would believe me. But that was probably the turning point. Um, was having that conversation with my dad and my little sister, um, and I, I can't lie to my dad, so yeah. <laughs> that was probably that turning point. Yeah. So it was helpful, even though people had been around and you were kind of internalizing their messages, it was also a person who kind of helped you recognize, okay, yeah, this isn't, I'm not okay yeah. right now. Yeah, well, Pearson, my question is, you know, I think a lot of what you shared uh, is things that a lot of other people have gone through or perhaps are going through right now. Um, and again, thank you for your courage and your boldness to share your story and to say, hey, yeah, I had, I had a, a dark season in my life, but um, I've moved past that. And like you said, there's days when I look back on that and say, hey, I, I, I kind of miss some parts of that. Maybe not everything that went on, but um, you feel you're in a healthier and better place now. So I guess my question for you would be, if someone is watching this and really relates to what you're saying, uh, what would you tell them? Um, the first thing I would tell them was that they're not alone. Um, I thought I was alone in this, and actually, through conversation with some of my teammates, I realized a lot of us were actually struggling with the exact same feelings. Mm. Um, we didn't realize this till afterwards, but it was really comforting to know that we're not alone in this. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing was that we're not meant to be in control. That's something that I thought I always had to be in control of. Um, we're not enough on our own to be in control, and that's where Christ comes in, um, because he loves us and desires that relationship just with us just because we're us. He sees us as enough to take the reins from us so that we don't have to worry about that. Um, we don't have to be a certain size or have these amazing lists of accomplishments or not have we don't have to not have any blemishes or things that have happened to us in the past um, in order for him to see our worth and to want to have that control for us. It's like what Jessica said. We, he doesn't want us or need us to reach a certain perfection because he already did. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so one of my favorite stories in the Bible that relates to this is um, the story of Jesus and the woman of Samaria or the woman at the well. So Jesus knew everything about this woman. He knew everything she had done, um, everything that had happened to her. She was married several times, but the woman, or the man that she was living with wasn't her husband, um, and the fact that he, that Jesus was a Jew, and she was a Samaria, a Samarian, made it all the more wilder that he was talking to her, but he shares with her the gift of God, and the living water that he gives us, so in John chapter 4, verses 13 through 14, he says to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water I, that I will give him will never be thirsty again, 
the water that I will give him will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. We do not have to worry about seeking this unreachable perfection because when we think that, when we think that we must have control and have this certain set of criteria for us to be worthy, we're always going to be thirsty. And I didn't, I didn't realize that because my brain conditioned me to think, oh, I, there's somebody else that's always going to be better. And then when I reach that perfection, then somebody else is going to be better. And so for anybody that is dealing with this or has maybe not this exact situation but has similar feelings, we are never going to be satisfied when we try to reach that perfection. Um, and so just resting and knowing that Christ is our identity and he going to him is, go- is what is going to satisfy us. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's probably what I would <laughs> tell yeah. them. Wow, that's a uh, that's tremendous. I mean, that is that's fabulous answer. And <laughs> you keep talking like that, you're going to be up here on Sunday <laughs> doing the preaching <laughs> and not just the interview <laughs> part of things. <laughs> well, kind of our last question, and you know, you've participated in this class with us this last many weeks, and um, we try to have a practical takeaway, right? We we want to share knowledge from a, a biblical perspective, from a clinical perspective, but then we don't want it just to be Uh, knowledge up here. We want it to be a practical takeaway that if we know someone or we ourselves are facing any of the things we've been talking about, uh, some practical steps. So I guess the last question should be, uh, in your healing process and in your continued healing process, what are some of those practical things that have worked for you personally? Not what you've heard about, but what worked for you? So I guess from a biblical standpoint, I'm always trying to be in prayer. Um, You can never have too much, and I always need to work on that. So that's something that always helps me, and it helps me stay calm and stable when I do have moments of anxiety. And also being in the Word of God, um, relationships are two-way streets, so I've got to put in some work. And that's been really helpful for me. And then also um, reframing my thoughts has helped me a lot um, and something I learned while I was in treatment. So reframing them away, reframing them in a way that helps me um, see why I need to treat my body well and why I need to eat, why I need to use healthy coping skills. That has also helped me because it's like, oh, I actually want to be able to help people. I want to be able to do all of these things in my life. And if I'm doing these things to my body, that's going to make me miserable and I'm not going to be able to do that. So reframing them, um, has been really, really helpful. And then with that, redirecting my behavior. So when I want to engage in an unhealthy behavior, whether it's over exercise or restriction or something like that, um, I try to determine what I can do with my time that I actually enjoy. So whether it's going on a hike, which is exercise that I actually really like, because like Robert said, nobody likes running, and I ran a lot. And (laughs) while I kind of like it sometimes, I don't really like it all the time. So (laughs) just doing stuff that I enjoy, and that's going to take my mind away from that maladaptive practice that I was doing before. Um, Some other things, well, that also kind of goes into mindful movement, which is doing exercise that you like to do, and being conscious of why you're doing it. Is it to keep me a certain size or is it to actually find joy and it's because I want to want to do um and then intuitive eating is a great tool and tip that I would recommend to anybody whether you deal with any new disorder or you deal or you don't or you have a great relationship with food um intuitive eating is basically where you um eat what you want and you everything's in um moderation, but um, you're eating when you're hungry and you're stopping when you're satisfied. So if I'm hungry, then I'm going to eat. And then whenever I feel satisfied, whether it's like, okay, I'm, I'm not overly full, but I'm full and I can hold myself for the next couple hours. And that's when I'm going to stop eating. And it's also, if I'm craving a brownie, I can eat the brownie. And then that way I'm not thinking about the brownie all the time. But then also if I'm craving, craving carrots and hummus, I can eat the carrots and hummus and then I'm satisfied. So that's a lot of what intuitive eating is. And that's also something that has really helped me um, in my relationship with the food. Yeah. Wow. Uh, the problem with me is I tend to crave the brownie over <laughs> and over and over again. The carrots and hummus are never something I don't think I've craved before. Um, but yeah, let's go. Awesome. So thank you, Pearson, so much. We are yes. so appreciative of her story and she did such a great job sharing it. I know there was, um, in a presentation like this, you put a lot of effort into it. So we yeah. really appreciate your time and your story and especially the message of hope that you shared with everyone. Thanks so much for that. Yes. Well, thank you all for having thank me. You. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we wanted to do an overview of some of the coping skills that um, we've talked about. So Robert, I'm gonna put it up here. There we go. So here are some strategies for coping that 
are helpful for any, um, any sort of slump you're in or uh, disorder you're dealing with, whatever you're going through, these are helpful for everyone. So the first one, describe the experience. What is going on? Like if it's depression, wow, I am experiencing these symptoms of this. Or I'm anxious, not just when I'm leaving my house, but I'm anxious when I'm talking to people, or I'm anxious when my phone rings, or I'm anxious when the dog barks, whatever mm. it is. Um, describe the experience. That's the first one. And then it's to identify the causes. Um, another way to think about it is try to seek out or search for what the root of the issue might be as opposed to just looking at the symptoms and dealing with those, mm -hmm. uh, taking a step back from your current situation like we talked about the first week, whether it's getting outside, leaving the room, yeah. turning off the phone, uh, shutting down whatever it is that's causing this, and then look deeper into what's going on and what's causing these feelings and emotions. Yep, I, and I shared the story last week of the lady who was cleaning her house, and she just realized that the reason why she was being irritable is because she was wearing a pair of pants that were too tight. So mm -hmm. we got we to gotta identify our causes, something deep like a core hurt, but also something physical that we're experiencing. Um, act on the truth. This takes a little work. And all of these strategies are something we want to share with you because we want to empower you in any part of your life to have a life that feels better. Um, but we also know that these are things that you can really explore deeper with someone helpful. Um, so acting on truth, we've given you lots of tools for what this truth looks like, and there are so many more out there. But acting on truth is literally kind of like what Pearson was just saying, reframing your thoughts, um, redirecting your behavior. Like we know that truth, um, and we're going to remind ourselves of some truths, but when we have this truth that Christ has given us about his love and his desires for us, that should spur us into uh, a sort of action, hopefully. And, and when it doesn't, it's a reassuring thing for us. Right. And we, we joked about putting number four on this list, but I, I was very adamant that we need to put on, on the list of strategies for coping, use the strategies for coping <laughs> to cope. Yeah. Uh, we, we, don't, we just can't get from point A yeah. to point P, right? There are a whole lot of letters in between, mm -hmm. and these various coping strategies, some might work to get you A through E, and then you're going to have to change because it's a different feeling or a different emotion, so use the coping Actually, skills. Actually, what we debated on was the coping skill, the only one listed was prayer and scripture reading at right. first. Mm -hmm. So that was our debate, is that those are a coping skill that I would encourage everyone to use, but for someone who does have a hurt of the church and of their faith and an insecurity about it, if I were to say, if you were to say, just pray about it, just go home, let's read scripture, let's look at Abraham's story, that might not be enough. So yeah. it might be, like you said earlier, turning off the phone, leaving the room, mm -hmm. setting a boundary. Those might be the coping skills. And I'd add to that, like we said, and don't hear either of us say that prayer and reading scripture yes. are bad things. Right. They are certainly good and practices to have on a daily basis. Uh, but you can also ask for help with those things mm -hmm. as well. It doesn't always have to be you praying to God, silently or loud. You could ask someone to pray for you mm -hmm. or pray with you. Or if you know someone in your life that has read the scriptures or someone you trust, you could say, hey, I'm struggling with X, Y, or Z. Do you know of a scripture that I could read or yeah. something that could give me some hope? Um, yeah. it, it isn't just always flipping open your Bible and hoping for the best. It's ask someone to guide you through that as well. And when we were hearing Pearson's story, you know, she talked about how she reads scripture and prays, and I like how she said you can never pray enough, which is a great way to put it for someone who might be insecure about how much they pray, <laughs> like me, um, that I'm always striving to be better at something. But looking at, or hearing Pearson's story, we saw that there were parts of her story where she had to look at her lifestyle in order for her to survive in this life. Like there were habits that were started that were so unhealthy that she was damaging her body. And so sometimes we need to look at our lifestyle. How often are we sleeping? Are you sleeping enough? Are you sleeping too much? Are you eating enough? Are you eating uh, good enough? Um, mm -hmm. 
the people that are around you, this goes into the next one, are they toxic people? Are they loving people? You know, we can't control what everyone tells us. We can't control anything that anyone <laughs> tells us but we can control what situations we put ourselves in sometimes. And so sometimes with conflicts, we just need to work on resolution in order to come to some peace so that we are not, there's this factor of uh, heightened emotion when you're around certain people who might, you might have conflict with. So that looks like uh, maybe having a hard conversation, maybe setting some boundaries with that person. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I'll just add, conflict was Conflict resolution can often look different yeah. from an outcome. You know, like we yeah. talked about, it could be a boundary, and unfortunately that conflict will just not be resolved anytime mm -hmm. soon. And so a boundary has to be placed. But yeah. someone like me, I don't do well with conflict. So if I, someone has made me upset or I know I've made them upset, even if it's awkward, it's I just need to get right to it and yeah. have that conversation and figure out what boundaries maybe mm -hmm. we need to set up so that doesn't happen again or reoccur. Mm -hmm. um, when I know someone's mad at me or I know that I'm mad at someone, I just have to go yeah. and deal with it. So that's me. Uh, and that ties into number seven, uh, which can be a little abrupt and we know that, <laughs> but it's the get to work. Uh, these things just don't happen because we want them to. Sometimes mm -hmm. they can, but more often than not, it requires some effort and some action on our part. Uh, and the important detail we wanted to add that we really haven't talked a whole lot about these last many weeks is um, this can also mean uh, serving others, mm -hmm. even in your pain sometimes, yeah. is just a way to re be reminded that you have value mm -hmm. by serving someone else, whether that's delivering a meal or writing a thank you note or sa uh, saying a prayer for someone other than yourself. Mm -hmm. Those are just little ways to kind of get out of the monotony of what whatever your routine has been. Exactly. That's something that uh, Christ or God has put in all of us is this desire for connection. Mm -hmm. We can't go through life just on our own all the time. There comes a point where we need help from someone, whether it's a doctor or it's a, we have therapist up there, whether it's a, a teacher teaching us something or a parent or a friend just giving us a helping hand. Um, so it's important for us to know that, that we're not supposed to be alone. We are made for connection. And so um, connection for ourselves, but also for others. So how are we continuing to give and to live in God's love for other people? Exactly. And so um, as we end our time together, we want to end with where we began, uh, with the same piece of scripture that has inspired uh, our thoughts on all mm -hmm. of our conversations these past few weeks. So uh, Jessica's going to read that passage of scripture for us, and then we just want to remind you of the four truths that we live our personal and public lives by, um, and then impart those with you as kind of our gift as we end this time together. So this verse that has kind of inspired our class today is Second Corinthian, in 2 Corinthians 5, and it says, he included everyone in his death so that everyone could also be included in his life, a resurrection life a far better life than people ever lived on their own. And so the truth that we carry with us is that God is with us. God accepts you. God wants you to experience a better life. And with Christ, we can live this life that is better than what we could imagine. And the truths that we talked about last week are that we have a hope in God. We have a joy in this salvation, this resurrection. And with that, we can show active love for God and others. And so we know that these are our seven truths. And you'll notice that uh, for us, they're all rooted in faith and what we believe. That mm -hmm. what we've talked about is um, it's rooted in scripture. It's rooted in uh, clinical practice, and like we said the very first week, there are far more similarities and tools that we share together mm -hmm. than there are differences or things we need to argue about. But the hope is that the mental health world and the church can come together to provide healing yeah. and hope for all of those who are in struggling or in need of support. When we're living in this truth, we also can be aware of the myths that are around us. And I wanted to include a few additional myths that we have not spoken about yet, but have come up in sessions. And we are just going to throw them out there. 
if I talk about my feelings, I'm giving the devil power over me. Therapy is sex, sexual, secular, not spiritual. Self-care is selfish. Medication is sinful because science is helping me, not God. These are just things that have come up in sessions that we have not talked about fully yet. Um, that it just proves there is more to talk about on this subject. Um, and we are so grateful that you have taken time to be with us and allowed us this platform. You know, Robert mentioned it's never too um, early to get started doing something, and you can't be too young for certain things that we might feel insecure about, and something that um, is a great example is this, and I think you and I have waited a long time to do a class like this, even though it's been part of our conversation f since we met 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it took us a while to get here, but we have really enjoyed the ride, and we're so grateful for you sticking around and hearing this. Yeah, so let's be reminded of our truths, and we'll close in a time of prayer. Let's pray together. Oh God, we thank you for uh, your presence with us. We thank you for the ways that you speak to each and every one of us. We thank you for the ways that you are still active in our lives, even as we experience fear and anxiety or depression or loneliness or insecurity. Uh, God, we know you never abandon us. You never leave us. And so as we uh, conclude this time and conclude this conversation and we go our different ways and back to our busy and chaotic lives in the year 2020, may we be reminded that you are with us, that you accept us, and that you want us to experience a better life, a life better than we could have imagined on our own. Mm -hmm. And so it may, it may it be so. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you again, and we'll hopefully talk to you soon. And if you have questions, know that we are available, and we'd love to continue the conversation. Be well, and God bless you all. Bye-bye.